Tom Scott still hasn't mentioned my video in his newsletter. You mean for the Scott bot that we built in the last video? Yeah. In my last video, I wrote some software to download all of the videos and transcriptions of educational YouTuber Tom Scott in order to recut his words together to get him to say things like this. Hello, this is not the real I'm Tom Scott. This is a simulation written by some code created by Data for Time. We even got him to sing. Never going to give you up. Never going to let you down. Never going to run, run, run around and desert you. Checkmate. Wait, what? How'd you do that? I don't know, just move the pieces. Wanna play again? Uh, sure. The hope was that Tom would see this video about him and mention it in his weekly newsletter, but still, there's nothing in the newsletter. I love his newsletter. If you're not already subscribed to it, it's basically a compilation of interesting videos and other intriguing things going on on the internet each week. Checkmate. Wait, what? That was so fast. How'd you win so fast? Oh, it's fool's mate. You basically gave it to me. You wanna play again? Uh, no, I'm too preoccupied with this Scott bot thing and I'm terrible at chess. Yeah, you're pretty bad at chess. Well, thank you for agreeing with me on something. You're welcome. Too bad you can't build a chess bot. Well, you certainly can. That's been done for decades. It's actually a really interesting form of artificial intelligence. Is it AI? Tom Scott doesn't think so. Because one of the cliches about artificial intelligence is that as soon as it can do something, that doesn't count as AI anymore. Playing chess, that's just brute forcing numbers. What? Chess computers aren't just brute forcing numbers. They have a lot of chess strategy and tactics built into their code. They know which moves tend to provide stronger positions on the board. And they've been able to do this for decades? Yeah, and computers these days are much faster at processing calculations. What if I built a chess bot that doesn't have any chess smarts to it? Chess smarts? Well, my chess computer will know the basic rules of chess, but it won't have any knowledge of chess strategy or tactics. Essentially, it will discover its own tactics empirically by just brute forcing numbers. You mean you're gonna program in all of the valid chess moves into a computer? That's right. Even castling? What? No, that's way too complicated. No castle. Castle! Castle! <laughs> How are you gonna test this chess bot? Because you are terrible at chess. Once again, thank you for the vote of confidence, but yes, I will test it against some existing chess computers, as well as some actual human opponents who can evaluate how it performs. And by the end of this video series, you too can play a game of correspondence chess against my robot, right here on YouTube. But enough talk, more data. It's data time! I am data. Computers that play chess are nothing new. IBM's Deep Blue supercomputer defeated world champion Garry Kasparov in 1997. Today, you can find tons of computer chess engines. So this is like a chess AI. Well, not really. As Tom Scott said, we wouldn't really consider this artificial intelligence by today's standards since it's just brute forcing numbers. What's the difference? Today, artificial intelligence is generally assumed to mean machine learning. That's where a computer learns as it plays. Deep Blue and other chess computers are just calculating every possible move and returning the best results they find. They never learn or change their programming unless a human programmer actually updates their code. How does a chess computer calculate its best move? So generally, there are two parts to a chess computer's algorithm, search and evaluation. First, a chess computer needs to try every possible move it can for its turn. Then, it needs to evaluate the board after that move to see how good it is. If a move captures an enemy piece, then that's a good move. If a move puts the enemy king in checkmate, then that's the best move. But if a move opens up the computer's defenses to an enemy attack, then that's a bad move. So, the computer can't just look at all of the moves in the current turn. It also has to look ahead to see if current moves will pay off later in the game. A search algorithm is needed to evaluate every move it can make, then evaluate every move its opponent can make, then evaluate every move it can make after that, and so on. Every move forward gives the computer a better view of the best possible outcomes in the game. So Deep Blue just calculated every possible move and then found the options where it won? Well, not exactly. It's actually impossible to calculate every possible move in chess. How many moves are there? More than you might think. In the opening of the game, each player can move their pawn forward one square, or they can move their pawn forward two squares, or they can move each knight into one of two squares. This means that for the first turn, or ply, there are 20 different choices that can be made. Then the other player has 20 moves that it can make. So at the end of the first move, there are 400 combinations. Well, that didn't seem too big. Well, it escalates quickly from there. 
After the second full move, there are nearly 200,000 possible games. And after three full moves, there are 121 million possible moves. The average chess game lasts about 30 full moves, which means that there are roughly 10 to the 104 possible outcomes you can play. That's more than the number of atoms in the universe. There is no way even the fastest computer in the world could calculate all of those possibilities. So then how does the computer figure out which moves it should choose? So that's where the evaluation comes in. We need a way to create a score for how good the board is for each move. The simplest approach is just count how many of your pieces are still on the board versus how many of your opponent's pieces are still on the board. If you capture more of your opponent's pieces than they captured of yours, then you're doing well. But capturing a pawn isn't as good as capturing a queen. Right, so we assign a value for each piece. We assign point values to each piece with kings being infinitely valuable. By summing up all of the pieces that remain on the board, the computer can estimate the value of that particular move and compare it to the value of other moves. So then Tom Scott was right. This is just brute forcing numbers. Well, there's more to the evaluation than just the pieces. Programmers can add tactics to the evaluation. How do you add tactics? Well, Deep Blue actually had data that was derived from hundreds of thousands of recorded Grandmaster games. This logic is essentially trying to take human knowledge and insight and encode it into a numerical function. So technically, it's still performing numerical calculations, but it has a huge insight due to all of the human knowledge that is provided to the computer. This is great, but I don't want a computer that just plays like existing grandmasters. I want the computer to find the best moves objectively without me having to tell it what I believe is best. Who knows, if left to make its own decisions, the computer might actually come up with a better solution than a human would have seen. So you wanna build a chess computer that doesn't take into account any human knowledge, but just looks many, many, many moves into the future to find the best, purest option. Exactly. That sounds like a lot of work. Well, yes and no. For this project, I chose to program in Go. Python is more popular because it's flexible and easy to code quickly, but it runs really slow when you have a program that needs to compute a lot of calculations per second, which is exactly what we need to do. The reason I like Go is because it can process a lot of calculations per second, but it's still easy to code like Python, making development much quicker and less painful. The first thing we need to do is represent the board in a way that can be saved from move to move as it plays someone. Because I don't want to take forever coding this, I'm not going to build a pretty interactive interface for this. Instead, I'm storing the board on disk as a text file, where each piece is represented as a letter, lowercase for black and uppercase for white, similar to the Fen notation, but spread out more visually in a table layout. This file stores the current layout of the board. My chess engine is a command line script that reads the board, calculates the move, and overwrites the file with the new board. I can then read this file in order to move the real piece on the real board. This might seem slow, but it really speeds up development if you don't have to build an interactive interface. Next, I need to tell the computer how to play chess, which is basically programming all of the legal moves into the computer. This was the part I was told would be the hardest, but it's not quite as bad as I thought. First, I add sanity checks to all the moves to make sure queens don't slide off the board or knights jump into oblivion. Next, I program the pawns, which are surprisingly the most complicated piece on the board. They can only move forward unless capturing a piece where they have to move diagonally. They can also move forward two squares, but only from their initial position. No other piece has this many exceptions. I also left out impassant, since that is such a strange and atypical rule. Next, I program the queen, which is actually a bit more straightforward. The queen can slide in all eight directions until it hits a piece and then has to stop. If a piece is a friendly piece, the queen has to stop short of that piece. If the piece is an enemy piece, the queen can capture it and then the queen has to stop. It's relatively painless to implement. Then rooks and bishops are basically just queens with limited directions and a king is a queen with limited range. So I'll just create a sliding piece function that parameterizes direction and range. Finally comes the knights, which are surprisingly straightforward since they just jump into position instead of sliding there. And there are only ever eight squares to check based on a fixed offset map. If the square is empty or occupied by an enemy piece, then it's a valid move. Oh, and I'm not even considering the castle move. Castle! Castle! Yeah, it's like really hard to track when castling is allowed. Okay, I'm now ready to start analyzing the best moves using the min-max algorithm. But what? The min-max algorithm is the search algorithm we use to find the best move. The algorithm looks at all the possible moves down to a predetermined depth. Then it evaluates the board to see its score and returns the best one up to the top. For the computer's turn, it picks the move that maximizes its score. But for its opponent's turn, it picks the moves with the minimum score. It's assuming that the opponent will pick the best score for itself, which from the perspective of the computer is a minimum score. It's essentially a recursive depth-first search algorithm, except it switches between maximizing and minimizing the value 
of each turn. Now this can branch out and create a ton of nodes that can take forever to process, and many of them are descendants of a move that no one would ever make. So to help optimize or prune this decision tree, we employ the help of alpha beta pruning. I won't go into it in detail because it's a bit confusing, but essentially, if we find a great move right away, we can automatically rule out terrible moves we later discover. If we get down to a certain point here and learn that the best possible move is still worse than the one we already have, we don't have to continue searching that branch. This works best if our algorithm happens to search good moves first. This was more complicated to implement than I realized, so thank you to Sebastian Log's videos, which were a critical resource to understanding the methodology behind this. Links to his videos are in the description. Lastly, I need to provide an evaluation function to determine which boards are better than others. Isn't that adding chess smarts to the computer? Eh, not quite. All I need to do is tell the computer the score of each piece so we can count up how many pieces of each side are available. All this does is tell the computer that sacrificing a pawn in order to capture a queen is very valuable. And with that, we should be done with the implementation. How well does it play? Well, first of all, it is not processing fast at all. I'm only evaluating about 100,000 moves per second. That sounds fast. The deep blue computer from 20 years ago was evaluating 100 million moves per second. Oh. So this means I can only really look ahead about two full moves in order to complete the calculations in less than a minute. Mm. Also, the computer's end game is terrible. It doesn't understand how to capture the king, even if it can. It seems like it believes that if it can capture the king in two moves instead of one move, it should prefer to delay capturing the king, which is wrong. What's worse is that when its king is about to be captured, it assumes the opponent will also delay checkmate. So the computer will actively move into check, assuming that the opponent will delay checkmate. Ugh. That sounds bad. This is a problem that I need to fix, but my workaround is that at the end of the game, I just limit the search algorithm to a depth of one move forward, and it seems to behave better. Honestly, it's not as bad as the computer's opening. It will sometimes just move a piece back and forth until the opponent attacks. Why does it do that? Well, the issue has to do with the fact that at the beginning of the game, if you can only look ahead a few moves, most moves evaluate to boards where none of the pieces are captured. Remember, this algorithm only values moves that result in captures. So if it can't see far enough into the future to see a capture, then it thinks all moves are really just the same. I spend a lot of time trying to tweak the code to fix the end game or look farther ahead to create a better opening, but nothing was working. I just can't get this computer to really play on its own. It was beginning to look like this video was going to be a failure. I had already invested all of my time just on writing this software and trying to get it to work. It looks like this is the end of the road. I'm not helping, am I? No, as per usual, you are not. I know what will make you happy. Babies and engineering. Well, I do enjoy both of those things. Then you're gonna love today's sponsor, Computer engineering for babies. My three-year-old niece loves hanging ornaments, building Legos, reading books, and all kinds of things. She probably should be an engineer, but we'll let her decide what career is right for her, which we know is engineering. So for Christmas, I got her a great little book called Computer Engineering for Babies, and now they're the sponsor of this video. Computer Engineering for Babies is a board book with two buttons and a light, where the buttons activate the light. Each page represents a different circuit, which means that the buttons turn on the lights differently on each page. An OR gate means you can press either button to turn on the light, but an AND gate requires you press both buttons. My little nieces don't understand electrical engineering, but it's great to see them introduced to engineering in a fun, interactive way that they can relate to. And even if they're not future engineers, which they will be, it's just a fun book to play with. I originally got it from my three-year-old niece, but it turns out my one-year-old niece really just loves pressing the buttons. If you know of a little one who loves interactive books, then this is definitely a great gift for them. Click on the link in the description to order your book today. And thanks to Computer Engineering for Babies for sponsoring this video. Does that make you feel better? Well, I always enjoy talking about my nieces, but it also gives me an idea about our issue. What's your solution? Well, clearly, I am not able to create a pure chess bot, but I've come all this way and done most of the work needed to create a chess bot that works. Maybe I should just give in to human knowledge. In the wise words of the YouTuber, stuff made here. So one thing that I like to say is that if at first you don't succeed, reduce your expectations until you're a success. So that's what I'm gonna do. In the second part of this video, I'm gonna add some chess strategy and tactics to the bot in order to get it to work better. Then I'll challenge my chess friends to a game and eventually show you how you can play against the bot right here on YouTube. Subscribe so you know when it gets published. Or if you're watching this in the future, it's probably mm, somewhere for you to watch. So you're gonna add more to the chess bot? That's right. Are you gonna add castling? No, 
No castling. Castle! Castle!